Okay, uh, thank you all for uh, coming out this early. Uh, I know it's early for me. Um, and yeah, I'm just going to carry on where we left off last time. So uh, what we saw the last time is um, the main question I want to try to answer in this lecture series, which is how we can derive quantum theory, quantum mechanics, from first principles. Um, and what we did basically is we covered some classic results up to like the 1960s. So we saw a Wigner's theorem, Stone's theorem, on one parameter unitary groups, Gleason's theorem, the Jordan von Neumann Wigner classification of Jordan algebras, the Kelvin Neimark um, embedding theorem of abstract C-star algebras and the concrete uh, C-star algebras. I skipped Piron and, uh, and Soleil because they're not super relevant, but I thought they were like a nice distraction. Um, and we saw that like, um, with all these results combined, the main question that really remains is deriving the structure of observables for quantum theory. So why do we get self-adjoint operators on a complex Hilbert space? Okay. So I want to look at that, that part a bit more closely in this lecture. So we're going to cover a few topics. First I want to do something which is quite uh, mathematical at first. So it's just a theory of ordered vector spaces. I just want to say a few things about it. It's going to be like 10 slides or so. Uh, then this should become more clear why I talked about it in the next section, where I'm going to talk about uh, generalized probabilistic theories, which are a uh, very general framework to talk about uh, arbitrary physical theories, and not just quantum theory, but also classical theory and also possible generalizations of quantum theory. Uh, and then a few topics in there, like I'm going to talk about composite systems and, and properties like, like local tomography. <coughs> and then I want to end uh, going through some modern reconstructions. These are reconstructions after the year 2000. They use the framework of GPTs, and um, uh, yeah, and I just want to go through, through the principles that they use and like and like how they use this to derive quantum theory. Okay, and I'm just going to see how far we get. All right, so first, the abstract mathematical stuff: ordered vector spaces. So uh, a vector space is ordered if it's a real vector space, and it has a partial order on it, which uh, is preserved by addition, basically. So if v small and v prime, if I add a vector w to both sides, it's still preserved by the order. And I can scale it by a positive real number and the preserves the order. Right. Okay. Uh, the interesting thing about such an order is it's completely determined by what we call the positive cone, which I'm someone's going to write as V plus. So it's just the elements that are greater than zero uh, via this relation. So V small than W, if and only if uh, W minus V is greater than zero. Okay. Uh, so a few examples. Um, if you have a um, if you have a bounded operator on Hilbert space. Uh, recall that we call it when it, that, that we call it positive when it has a positive expectation value on uh, all uh, factors, um, and then if you just take the self-adjoint um, operators, this becomes an order vector space where you say a is smaller than b if and only if b minus a is positive. So the expectation value is smaller for every possible state. Okay. Uh, other examples that are very much related is if I have an arbitrary Caesar algebra. I can say that an element A is greater than zero when there exists some B such that A is, A is of this form. And then the self adjoint elements of a Caesar algebra also form an order vector space. Uh, similarly, for formally real Jordan algebra, uh, if A is a square, then we say it's positive. Okay. Uh, it's not uh, super obvious uh, why these two are, in fact, order vector spaces. You need to do quite a bit of math in order to get there, but it is true. Uh, yeah, I want to point out a specific example with the Jordan algebra stuff that I think is, I think is uh, interesting. I don't know if it's a coincidence or not, but uh, if you take your algebra to be a spin factor, which I like, discussed briefly in the last uh, lecture, um, <coughs> then a element uh, of a vector at t is greater than zero, even only if t squared is larger than the inner product. So you might recognize this as sort of a light cone in the thing. So the spin factor, the order structure is just, um, yeah, it's just you have this positive light cone and then the negative will be the negative light cone. So this is kind of like a Minkowski space time kind of thing. Uh, at least on the level of like causality and like you be able to say like which thing happened after another thing. Uh, okay, so uh, if you have to if you have to order vector spaces, an order isomorphism is simply a bijec linear bijection that preserves the order in both directions. <coughs> so v small and w, uh, if not if yeah. This relation, um, and uh, there are different properties related to this. Is if we give v some chosen topology, and I mostly care about the finite-dimensional setting, and in the finite-dimensional setting, 
there's like a unique canonical topology in the vector space because it's isomorphic to uh, R n for some n, and you just inherit the topology from that thing. So then you usually have to choose the topology. Um, then if you have a topology, we can take the positive cone C and we can take the interior of it, right? Because you have a topology, so you can take the interior of the space. And we say that this vector space is homogeneous, or we say that the cone is homogeneous, actually. When for every two elements in the interior positive cone, we can find an order isomorphism that maps one into the other. So why do we call this homogeneous? Well, it means that uh, if, we own, if we're only concerned about the order, then any two elements in the interior positive cone are equivalent, because you can map one into the other. Okay, so that's, it's the space is sort of maximally symmetric in this sense. Excuse me, can you repeat what's the interior cone again? Uh, yes, yeah, so we, we, we pick a topology, yeah. right? and we can, we can, because we have an order, we have a positive cone. Okay, right. Yeah, and then we take the interior of the positive cone, just okay. using the topology, like okay. to open the, uh, yeah. Thanks. Okay, uh, so examples again. Uh, if I have self joint operators on the Hilbert space, this is in fact homogeneous, with respect to, op or to the operator non-topology. Uh, the way you can see that is if I take a um, operator here, this lies in the interior positive cone, even only if A is greater than some epsilon times the identity. And that means that A is invertible. Okay? So if we have uh, two such invertible positive A and B, then we can pick our order isomorphism to be of this form. And then you can quite easily see that if I pick C to be A, then A cancels against itself, and then this, you have square, uh, square root of B, square root of B becomes B, so it indeed maps A to B. And so this, this is sort of the order of that witnesses that you can map all A to B. Okay. And you can do something similar for C to algebra as a form of real general algebra. So they are also homogeneous. Okay. Different property for order vector spaces. Um, if I have an order vector space with a positive cone C and an inner product, right, then I can define a dual cone. And this is simply all the vectors in V that have a positive inner product with all the other positive elements. Okay, and then we can say V is self-dual when these cones uh, are uh, when these cones coincide when they are the same. So that means that like V is greater than zero if and only if V, comma W is greater than zero for all W greater than zero. So it becomes sort of this self-referential kind of thing. Um, example again operates on Hilbert space, but then only for finite dimension because otherwise you don't have the inner product. Uh, so you just take the inner product to be the trace and the product of the uh, two operators. And you can quite easily show that it's self-dual with respect to this inner product. Mm. Um, for drawn algebra, you have to do something a bit more clever. Um, so we say a real drawn algebra is a Euclidean, where it is a finite dimension, and it has an inner product, such that the Jordan product operator is symmetric with respect to the inner product. Okay. I have to say, because these are real vector spaces, inner product for me, for me means a symmetric product, not Hermitian, because there's no complex thing. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, an uh, interesting thing, which is really a very non-trivial fact, is that <coughs> for a finite dimensional real Jordan algebra, the Jordan algebra, Jordan algebra is formally real, if and only if it is Euclidean. So this is a different way to define the structure that I talked about in the last lecture. And it turns out that those are self-dual. Okay. Uh, why do I talk about homogeneity and self-duality? Well, that is because of a uh, really cool theorem that is... Uh, so, like, I think the, the full proof is actually on Wikipedia, like some Wikipedia editor was really diligent about this. Um, so if I have a finite dimensional self-dual homogeneous order vector space, then V is order isomorphic to a Euclidean Jordan algebra. So this is a completely order theoretic uh, uh, characterization of Euclidean Jordan algebra. So you can just, just refer to like the order structure and you get the Jordan algebra structure for free. Can, can you just show again what is Euclidean? Euclidean, yes. So Euclidean is, I have an, I, I have an inner product, mm -hmm. and uh, the, uh, I can take the Jordan product to the other side. Okay. So let's say that um, if I take uh, the left product operator for that, uh, mm -hmm. the Jordan, that, that this is symmetric with respect to the inner product. Yeah. So yeah, so um, this is a really uh, cool and useful theorem. Um, and also, um, like, there's quite a few people interested in homogeneous order vector spaces because of uh, linear programming and cone programming and stuff. And so they often work with the like, Jordan algebra because of this property. Because like, you can just, if you also have self self duality, then you can do this stuff. Um, yeah. So uh, just to recall, fact like uh, last lecture I showed that like any uh, formally real Jordan algebra, so also Euclidean Jordan algebra, 
is a direct sum of simple ones, and those simple ones are either like a matrix algebra over real numbers, complex numbers, quaternions or octonions, or they are spin factors. So just from this order structure, we get already quite close to just getting quantum theory. Okay, mm -hmm. and so like quite a few reconstructions, they <laughs> they they start in order vector space, and then they show itself dual and show it's homogeneous, and then you have you can draw an algebra and do a few more things, and then you get the complex matrix algebra, which then would be uh, quantum theory. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. Okay, so a few more things, a, a structure that you could have in order vector space. Uh, so there's a thing called an order unit. Uh, it's basically <coughs> for every vector, this vector is between the, the order unit on both sides. If I just multiply this uh, order unit by an like, appropriate number, okay, appropriate positive number. Um, and then we can we write uh, the unit interval, which is just all the elements below uh, u. And so this property basically says that the linear span of the unit interval should be the whole space. That's what this property yeah. actually says. Okay. Uh, example, well, the identity operator in some of the operators is an order unit. Um, almost by definition, right, because the norm needs to be finite, so you can almost like take the identity to be bigger than anything. Uh, same thing if the Caesar algebra is unital, then the unit is an order unit, and also for a Euclidean drawn algebra, they are always unital, and the unit is an order unit. Uh, order units are not unique. Uh, first, if you have a homogeneous, if you have a homogeneous order vector space, then every internal positive element is an order unit. If you have a single one. Mm. Okay, so a property that order units can have is being Archimedean, which basically says there are no infinitesimal elements. So it says if I have a vector and it fits beneath my order units for like every possible scaling I can have, then the vector must have been below zero to start with. Uh, so you can imagine if you don't have this property, then I can have a vector that's positive, and I can scale it arbitrarily high, but it stays below this fixed element. So it's a sort of infinitesimal element. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I have an order vector space, and it has some fixed Archimedean order unit, I call the space an order unit space. And order unit space turn, turn out to be really nice and really well behaved, and you can do a lot of nice mathematics with them. Uh, and there's a few different characterizations of an order unit space. I'm going to walk through some of those things because they're quite relevant for the operational approach to quantum theory. Uh, oh yeah, and uh, yeah, all examples I've given so far of order vector spaces, so uh, the subunit operators, Caesar algebras, Hugh and Jordan algebras, they're all order unit spaces. Uh, just to give like sort of a, a counter example, so this is, a, this is not an uh, order unit space. So if I just take a uh, two-dimensional real vector space and I equip it with, with the Lexco graphic order, so say a, b is greater than zero, if a is strictly greater than zero, or a is zero and b is greater than zero. Okay? And we can show that one zero is an order unit, but one zero is bigger than like this vector for every n, so it's not Archimedean. Um, okay. So if we have an order unit, we can define this thing which is called the order unit in this case, the semi-norm, but usually it's called the order unit norm, which just assigns the smallest number to V that like, makes it fit beneath the order unit. And this is only a semi-norm, because it does always satisfy the triangle inequality, which is quite like, obvious to see. Uh, and it also satisfies the homogeneity condition, but the thing that fails is the norm of V can be zero without V being zero, which happens precisely when V is infinitesimal. Okay, so proposition. An order unit is Archimedean, even only if, this thing is a proper norm, and the positive cone is closed in, the, in, 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 its, in its topology. Okay? Mm -hmm. yes. Sorry, um, <coughs> I'm starting to be lost, mm -hmm. you, because there are many definitions. I know, there's many, many stuff, yes, yes, yeah. And it's hard for me to... Uh, yeah, it's still early, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Could you just at this point maybe you recall where you want to go? And what's, what's the point of all these definitions and um, borders and... Yes, so the, the point is that uh, later we will work in this operational framework, which is from very general principles, like we get very general theories, and it turns out that to describe those, you get order vector spaces. So my goal is as, uh, in the end is that order vector spaces are actually the most general physical model for modeling physical systems, okay. which should become clear, yeah. Maybe I should have like flipped the order of doing things, but uh, yeah. Uh, we're almost through like the, the hard mathematical part, and then we get to the operational part. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, yeah, so there, there's also the, this, this, this topological definition being not even space. So that's the, the, the point. Okay, this is, I think, the, you see, this is the, yeah, prior final thing. Okay, um, so this is also just a, a generalization of states on the quantum system. Is um, We can define a state or the order of vectors or order of units, which is just a linear map to the real numbers that maps the order unit to one. And we, we denote the space of states by, uh, well, just states of V. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna usually gonna write this. I'm just gonna write instead of u. I'm just gonna write one, so we just get that omega maps one to one. Um, is it is it the same definition as in the usually for sister algebras? Yes, it's coincides. Yeah, yeah, it's the positive linear unital map. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you have, for instance, if you have subject operators and it's fine dimensional, that each each such such state corresponds to a density operator. Uh, so this this definition sort of recovers the definition you expect for states, namely you get these density operators. And in fact, this is an abstract kind of property of all self-dual order unit spaces. So this trace you uh, can also define with respect to the inner product. Because um, like the, the trace of an element A is actually the inner product of the A with 1. So you can, yeah, if you have the inner product you get this trace and mm -hmm. the similar property holds for all self-dual order unit spaces. Um, uh, yeah, so there's also then again there's a definite there's a characterization of unit spaces in terms of states, namely if it has enough states that the order is completely characterized by uh, this sort of pointwise order on the states, right? So if uh, if omega a is always smaller than omega b for all states omega, if that implies that a is smaller than b because the other direction it holds always, then uh, this is only true if it's an uh, if it's an unit space. So all unit space can be seen as an order vector space with, with enough states. That's kind of the idea. Okay, so um, an interesting example of all unit spaces is uh, if I take a compact Hausdorff space, which is the topological space, and I look at the functions from this Hausdorff space to R, continuous functions. Uh, usually this symbol is used to denote functions to complex numbers, but for me it's always going to mean real number, uh, to real numbers, because I only need real numbers. Uh, this turns out to be an order unit space, <coughs> and there's a pointwise order, just so just uh, the function is greater than zero if it's greater than zero on all points x. Uh, the order unit is just a constant function that maps everything to one. Okay. And it turns out to also have an algebra structure. This algebra structure is also pointwise, so we just multiply it on each point. And this algebra structure is of course bilinear, like it's linear in each argument. But it also has this property that it preserves positivity, so if I have two positive elements, the product is also positive. Um, and it turns out, uh, and like this result is not really necessary for the rest of the course, but I think it's such a beautiful theorem that I just wanted to share it. Um, it's Skeleton's representation theorem. And it says that if I have an order unit space and it has a bilinear operation that preserves positivity, then there must be a compact Hausdorff space such that this vector space embeds in a dense way into, into such a C of X. So what I find really surprising about this is we don't assume associativity, we don't assume commutativity, we don't assume anything, only that it preserves positivity. And somehow this already restricts it so much that it must be this really nice, well-behaved space. Um, and this is a useful fact that like, um, is used in some, in some reconstructions. I know it's used in my reconstructions. Um, and... Uh, yeah, you can also use it uh, to, um, like, if you have this theorem, then, like, some, uh, some theory in C-star algebra becomes easier, like, if you want to prove that uh, commutative C-star algebra is on a, on a uh, yeah, it's of this form. Um, yeah, okay, so, oh, yeah, and then the cor corollary of this theorem is that if I have a finite dimensional unit space and it has a positive preserving linear operation, it must be isomorphic to just uh, Euclidean space with point wise order and product, so it's, it must be a very simple space. All right, so yeah, that was like the abstract stuff. Um, and now, um, hopefully, something that you'll find less abstract. Um, all right, so the idea of uh, most modern reconstructions of quantum theory is to do it fully from like an operational vantage point, so that you're only referring to quantities that are operational. So. What does that mean? It basically means that something's operational if it corresponds to something that you can actually observe, like in a lab, for instance. So in relativity, I would say that like 
correct me if I'm wrong, but like the operational things are like would prefer like you have like clocks or you have like measuring rods and you have the concept of an event and the concept of an, of an observer. But a priori, not the concept of an invariant interval, because it's not necessarily clear how you can measure this in the lab, but if you could somehow make a procedure that would measure this, then this concept would become operational. For instance, like entropy a priori is an abstract quantity, but like if you're doing like Shannon information theory, you can like if you, you can calculate like the entropy of a channel and then it becomes something operational that you can measure, so then entropy becomes an operational quantity. So being operational is not something that like is super obvious, something you need to work to show that something is operational. Um, and what's important for, for, for me and for the field of reconstruction quantity theory is that measurement probabilities are operational. Because they basically say, like, if I prepare this state, and I apply this transformation to the state, and I do this particular measurement, and I do this many times, and, I rec and then I can record the probability of the measurement giving this particular outcome, so then that number, this probability, is an operational thing, because I've just described it, how you would get this number, right? Okay. Um... Yeah, okay. And do you need to be able to explicit a procedure to do the measurement or I mean as long as it's a priori doable you will say it's operational? Yeah, it's it's not any it's not any formal thing. It's just like um the, like does does it smell operational? Like it's more that's more the yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So um is, uh, I, 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 I already dropped this term, uh, generalized probabilistic theory, and that's what I'm going to define now, what, that, what, that, what such a thing is. I'm going to usually just shorten this to GPT. Uh, I just want to say that like, in the literature, sometimes people use the term operational probabilistic theory. You could argue there are some differences, but I'm not. I'm just going to conflate the two, I'm just going to call everything a GPT, just for, to make it a bit more straightforward. Okay, so. Um, it's, a GPT is, it consists of a few like interlocking things that you have access to, like uh, a few different structures. If you if you if you like category theory, you can think of it as a certain type of category. That's kind of the idea. Uh, so we have a collection of uh, types of physical systems. I mean, just, I'm just going to label these A, B, C, whatever. Uh, so you can think of these like um, like maybe it's like an, it's like an atom, or it's like uh, it's like a black box that I have access to that I can do some things with. Um, and I for, I'm going to say that every physical system has a certain set of ways I can prepare it into a state. So it's just like if I have my, 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 my black box and I, I pull some levers or whatever, and, like if I, and if I do it in the same way every time, then I get the same state every time. That's basically the definition of what I mean by a state preparation. Just doing the same thing, you get the same thing. Um, oh, doing the same thing, you get the same thing. That's, that's including like probabilistic aspects of like the preparation. Okay, so like if I do a certain thing and then like something probabilistic happens inside the system, then I just see this actual status probability distribution over the possibilities. Mm -hmm. So that's just incorporated into this thing. Mm -hmm. um, then like this system can maybe be transformed in certain ways. So I just get these like transformations and they transform a state on A into a state on B. So like if my state is like an atom, a transformation could be, um, let's say, um, like maybe I shoot at another atom and like it sticks together and it becomes a bigger system or something. Like I don't know, like something like that. Um, like trans transformations for me are not. Uh, 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 uh. So it so doesn't happen in the same system. They transform. Yeah. So you can think of these as distinct steps in like when you're doing something in your lab. Like first you're working and like you're preparing your system and then you step back and then maybe maybe you're shooting a laser at it or something and mm -hmm. the laser shooting is like the transformation or whatever. Okay. And that's like the second step. And the third step is doing a measurement. So we're going to represent a measurement by a collection of what we call effects. Uh, and right now these are just like abstract things. I haven't told you yet what they are actually. Um, and the idea is that they're just an abstract way to represent outcomes of a measurement. So if a system is in a state omega, then I'm just going to say that to each a, j, we associate a probability. I'm going to write as... Uh, Pull this bit off. Does this work? Yeah. Um, like it just associates a probability. So this means that like I observe the outcome j if the state is prepared in the state omega with this probability, like it's some number between zero and one. And of course, like this must be all the possible outcomes of the measurement. So if I sum over all probabilities, it should sum up to one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is this so far so clear? Like what kind of stuff we have? 
I'm gonna make it a bit more concrete later because uh, right now this is just a set. It's super general, right? So I need to have a bit more structure on this. Yeah. But is it uh, okay to think about those <coughs> systems in terms mm -hmm. of algebras? Um, or is it not the way you think about it? Yeah, so for me, the system isn't really anything. I'm re it's really the state and the effects are things. Okay. Because, uh, like, yeah, we're taking an operational, right? And, mm -hmm. and states are something operational, but yeah. a, a physical system is, n is nothing. It's yeah, only yeah, the yeah, way we interact with the physical mm -hmm. system is something. Okay. Mm -hmm. it, it should become a bit more clear when I say a bit more about this stuff. All right, so, as I said, like, f right now, uh, this is just a set. This has no structure, but we need to add some, like, we have some structure on it, actually. So if I have two different states, well, I can, so it's, I have like uh, uh, I can do certain thing with my I can do a certain thing with my system of it, of my black box and it prepares it in state omega one. Or I can do something else and I get the state omega two. Well, what if I step back and I throw a biased coin and based on the outcome I either prepare the first state or prepare the second state, right? Mm -hmm. Like I can do that and I get sort of this probabilistic mixture. Uh, like I still get like preparation of my system regardless of my outcome. So I'm just going to denote the states like in a very suggestive way, as sort of this like uh, convex combination of states, and this just makes this into a convex set, like sort of in an abstract sense. Um, and the interesting thing is, is if I have some measurement outcome a, then like of course like I I, uh, I throw my bias coin, and if I get the first one, and then I do measurements, or if I throw a bias coin and I get the second outcome, and do my measurements, like the probabilities that I will observe this outcome a will be this convex mixture of those two different things. Okay, so these effects act in sort of a convex manner on this mm. one set of states. Um, similarly, you can do it for effects, right? I can decide to do like, with probability p, this measurement, or probability 1 minus p, that measurement. Like you can also do a convex mixture of measurements. Um, and that makes the effect space a convex set. And then again, like uh, the states act in this way only because like it should respect these classical probabilities here. Okay. Uh, yeah. So we we now say okay, uh, the state space and the effect space are convex sets. So that's like the extra structure you've added on it. And like it's uh, this convex structure is sort of respected by these the way you can associate probabilities to these things. Okay. So. Uh, okay, so suppose I have. Um, Two different ways of, of, of preparing a state, okay? And then I give you, uh, uh, I give the system to someone else. I give the system to you, and I say, okay, uh, you can do whatever you want with the state, and I need you to tell me in which state I prepared it. Well, if for every possible measurement outcome you get the same statistics, there's no way for you to know the difference. Like you, you don't know like in which state I prepared it. Which is the case here. So we have two different states. We have to act the same on all possible effects. Well, then we, they are operationally indistinguishable. There's nothing we can do, and there's no experiment we can do that says these states are different. So I'm just going to say these states must be the same. And operationally, that's true. Okay. Uh, but the same thing we do for effects. Like if, um, if, I, if, if I have like, maybe two different measurements, but like, they give exactly the same uh, statistics regardless of the state they prepared, um, then like, they must, be, must have been the same effects. Okay. Okay, so uh, now we can summarize it in a bit more concrete manner. So I just say for every system A, we have a convex set, the state space, we have a convex set, the effect space, and we have a function that I'm just going to call P for now, that uh, takes a state, it takes an effect, and outputs probability 0, 1, um, such that it's, it's by affine, so it's affine in both parameters, so just it respects this, uh, it respects this convex structure. And it's determining, which is means what I just said about the operational equivalent. If I have two different states, then there must there must be some effect, such as these probabilities are different, because otherwise I couldn't I couldn't distinguish them. And the same for effects. If I have two different effects, there must be some state such that it maps it to a different probability here. Is this clear so far? Yeah. Uh, what's the meaning of p? Uh, p is just what I what, what I wrote here as um, omega of a. I'm, I'm now writing as uh, p of omega comma i. So it's just a different way of writing this function of associating probabilities to a state and effect. Uh, I, I'm not going to use this notation like later, just like uh, sort of making it like in sort of nice one single function to put all these things together. So there's a, there's a 
Condition missing is something like that the sum. Oh yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, like it's like yeah. So the I, sh I should have also added that like there's there's some extra suction on the effect space, namely that some collections, some sets of uh, effects, they sum up to one, which is sort of like this other information you're putting in. So this is actually yeah, you're right. This is actually not a complete description of a GPT, but uh, this is the most relevant part. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, and then we also have transformations, uh, and they now become affine maps from the state space or they become affine maps from the effect space, now in the opposite direction. Um, like if you're a computer scientist, you might think of this as like a, uh, as like a, a state transformer and an effect transformer. Or if you're a physicist, you might think of this as the Schrodinger picture, you might think of this as the Heisenberg picture. Okay, so examples of like how this fits into quantum theory. Um, just for every system A, we associate a finite dimensional uh, in a GPT framework, we usually work with five-dimensional things. Uh, it does no, you don't have to, but it's usually done that way. Um, you have a complex Hilbert space. Uh, then the effect space is simply all the positive operators beneath the identity. So these are historically have also been called effects of a, of a Hilbert space. And they are like the, if the projections are the sharp measurements, then the effects are like the fuzzy measurements with a sort of uncertainty in there. Uh, and the states are simply the density operators. And then this function p is just uh, you take a trace of these two things. Um, all right, and then so so a collection of effects that corresponds to a measurement is just a collection of effects that sums up to the, that sums up to one. Um, yeah, the transformations that correspond to uh, positive trace preserving maps uh, actually completely positive, but we get to that later. Um, uh, I said in previous lecture that uh, Gleason's theorem was surprisingly hard to prove. But in this setting, it actually almost becomes trivial. Because um, if, I, if I say, okay, well, um, if, I, if, I, if I fix a, a, a state here, then what I get is I get a, uh, a function that goes from the effect to 0, 1, uh, which maps 0 to 0 and 1 to 1. Um, and you can show really quite easily, just extending the function to larger and larger domains, that there must be a unique density operator row if I have such a function, such that it's implemented by this row. So this basically says that if I know my effect space and I know my states correspond to these functions that map effects to probabilities, then uh, my states must have been dense operators. Um, and also, like, so if I know my effects, I get my states and I get, uh, and, and, and I get a measurement rule, uh, I also get my transformation. So again, actually it's, only, it's sufficient to only say what my effects are for this GPT. So in this, set, in this case, the effects, it's something like a self-adjoint operator, no? uh, Yeah, so because I'm saying they are greater than zero, because this is a unit interval, right? And greater than zero implies self-adjoint. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, is that easy to see? Um, yeah, that's not super straightforward, but it is true. Inside the self adjoints you can define positivity, but only yeah. in the whole. Yeah, thing. yeah, you can because uh, uh, you can define positivity as this. Um, positivity was defined as uh, this condition, right? Yeah. Um, so this 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 works for like arbitrary operators, um, and then you can, like, this implies that it's self adjoint, like it's not. Uh, yeah, I, could, I think it takes a bit of work, but I don't think it's super hard to prove. But I don't know what the plan is. Okay. Uh, yeah, so this is quantum theory. Um, the way that classical mechanics, or classical theory, or classical probability theory is usually presented in the GPT framework is that for every uh, system, it corresponds a, a some natural number n. And then we say the. Uh, and the intuition here is that uh, the system n is. Um, I have a system with n distinct states. There's n possible states it could be in. Uh, and then the state space is just the simplicity. So these are just the probability distributions over these n points. So they're all the mixtures of my pure state. The pure state being like, it's definitely in this, in this position, it's definitely in this position. Uh, and the effects, again, like the pure effects say, like, you are know, testing, like, is the state in this position or is it in this position? And they're just like uh, mixtures of those pure uh, measurements. Yeah, we just associate probabilities just by taking the inner product. Uh, and then transformations are just affine maps. So, um, um, is, is, is it clear why this would be a classical system? Not so much. Okay. 
So the idea is because you have uh, n distinct points that are your extreme points of your, of your state space. So if I have... So uh, first, first of all, what do you say that systems correspond to natural numbers? Uh, yeah, so I just mean that like for every system A, uh, I can associate some natural number n. And then like for a, say n, say n is 3, mm -hmm. I can have like 3 points. And these are the three distinct states my system can be in. But of course, like I said, like it's a complex set. So I can also say my system is with probability 50% in this state or this state. So I get the point here. But also like it could be 75% this state and 35% this state. So I get this entire line of states it could be in. The same here, I get an entire line of things it could be in, entire line. But also it can be here in the completely mixed state, which is like probability one third being this state, probability one third being this state, probability one third being this state. Um, is that so classical? Yeah. <laughs> it's classical probabilistic, so it's not deterministic. But um, the reason we call it classical is because um, if I write this as like um, if this state is the vector one zero zero, and this one is zero one zero, and this one is zero zero one, then if if my if I take my effect, take my effect to be the effect um, zero one zero. And this effect is measuring, is the state in this state, in this point, okay? Um, and like if it is in fact in this state, I get this outcome with Holmes probability. And here, is, here it says, with zero, here it always says, no, it's not in that state. And here it, says, always, here it always says, not in that state. But if I'm on the state here, and I do this measurement, uh, it tells me, well, there's a 50% probability you're in this state, uh, or like not. Um, so the reason we call it classical is because these endpoints are um, perfectly distinguishable. So there's no um, inherent uncertainty about it. Like I can just um, I, I can I can make a measurement. I'm, I can um, I can take a set of effects uh, one zero 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 one zero 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 one, and uh, if I do this measurement uh, on uh, any state, I can completely determine the state. Like I know everything about the state, and um, and I can also perfectly distinguish, like like with 100% probability between these three states. Um, and that's kind of like the, the property that that GPT people uh, see as classical. That we have uh, that every pure state is pu perfectly distinguishable from every other pure state, which is not the case in quantum theory, for instance. Yeah, but the classical here refers to probability theory. Or classical probability theory. Okay, yeah. so you don't think about this as classical systems, describing um, classical systems. So the system itself could be just classical, yeah. but because I'm allowing myself to like throw co uh, to like like flip coins and make decisions based on that, mm -hmm. I make it probabilistic. Yeah. Okay. Right? I put the probabilities in, it's sort of like inherent yeah. into the. To the thing. It's yeah. like what he was saying earlier that you flip a coin to decide which measurement you can make. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so there even though the system might be deterministic because I'm not deterministic, like mm. I'm sort of embedded with probabilities. Mm. Okay. How much time do you have left? Um, Quite a bit okay. Still small ten minutes. Okay, okay. Uh, let's see where we are. Okay, yeah. Okay, so now to get back to order vector spaces and like why I told you about this stuff. So, for any system A, I can have a, a well, what I call it, associated vector space. I'm just going to write as VA. Then you just take formal linear combinations of effects. So this this just um, is not a sum in any space. It's just I just say like I just take a sum in sort of the abstract space of sums. Um, but now I'm going to make it into a true vector space by defining an equivalence relation on it. Namely, I say these two formal sums are equal, if and only if, like, if I put a state here, like, they're equal for all possible states. Mm -hmm. okay, so I sort of mod out the equalities that are given by states. Um, and it turns out that this vector space we get is ordered, uh, namely we say this thing, this sum is smaller than this sum, if only if it's smaller for all possible states I can put in there. Oh, the reason this is well defined is because states are like they act on an affine way on mm -hmm. these effects, so they interact well with these uh, with this uh, linear structure. Um, okay. Yeah, so what we get is we get this ordered vector space VA, and then the effects embed as a convex subset in here, 
And this is useful because it means we can we are we can now define what it means to take a sum of effects, namely just the sum that we take in this vector space. And these states now become linear positive maps from V A to R. So they, these are now states on this order vector space. Okay, so this is this is why GPT people care about order vector spaces, because it's like it's usually easier to work with a vector space than with a complex set. So we just embed it into this order vector space. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So uh, a bit more uh, structure that's usually put onto a GPT is uh, the ability to coarse crane a measurement. So if I have two measurements, I have a measurement A1 to AN, I have a measurement B1 to BK, I say that A1 of like this A measurement is a coarse graining of this B measurement. If I can partition the outcomes of A in such a way that like uh, I get B for some of these outcomes. So uh, for instance, if I have this measurement consisting of three possible outcomes, I can just take these two outcomes together, and then I'm testing, is it in the third state, or is it like in state one or state two? So I'm sort of like putting these two possibilities together, and that's, like a, that's what's, what they call the coarse craning. Then your n must be smaller than your k, or... Uh, or n is opposite. larger than k. Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's the opposite. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, so recall that um, we, we said that like, if we have an actual measurement, it should give this uh, probability one if I <laughs> sum over all possible outcomes. Um, okay, so that means that, like, by operational equivalence, if I, if I take this sum that I have here, for instance, of all these different elements, I get a sort of unique effect one. Um, and this, by this definition, it's, it's, it goes to one for all possible states. Okay? Uh, and this turns out to be an order unit on the vector space. And as we sort of define, the way we define this vector space VA, these states determine the order on, 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 on the vector space. So that means that VA is an order unit space. Okay? Just when you say, so A is finer than B, mm -hmm. but you say no, that so A, a is a coarse graining. Of, so it's a, it's a more coarse, it measures more different, different oh, outcomes. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you could say that, you could also say that um, A1 to AN is a refinement of B1 to BK, it's also yeah. a term sometimes used. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, so a thing I want to say is um, the way I define, basically because I require this property, uh, I actually put in causality. I put in uh, a non-signaling condition, which is not super obvious. Um, but like, there's just like a more general way to define states. And then you have to sort of put it in an extra axiom that says, I have a unique deterministic effect. And having a unique deterministic effect via some constructions can be shown to be equivalent to a GPT being non-signaling. So it has sort of this causality structure. I'm not really going to say much about it because I don't super understand this very well. But um, the point being that I'm sort of putting in causality uh, like just from a definition from how I define a GPT. So there are people that work with like non-causal GPTs so that you don't necessarily have, to have a causality condition then you can do some more general things. But like I'm not going to do that in these lectures because it's uh, like it's for me it breaks my intuition and like I, I, it's hard. <laughs> and then if you do that, you also don't get ordering space; you just get arbitrary artifact spaces. Okay. Uh, okay. So now just like recapping what I just said, like how we how can we now like say what a GPT is? Well, so for each system A, we have an ordering space V A, and then the effects are a convex subset of the. Uh, the unit interval of this order vector of this order unit space and it contains zero and it contains one, because the effect zero you can see as um, uh, the measurement always fails. Like the measurement just always gives, always tells you no, like you, you did not measure the thing, or like like just always uh, does not give the outcome. And one is just a measurement that basically says, is there a system? So like if I have if I have if I have prepared a system and I do this measurement, like it always tells me yes because I've prepared a system. I'm like yeah, it's just testing for if the system exists. Uh, the states are a order separating convex subset of all the states of this order vector space, or the unit space. Um, and transformations now have become uh, positive unital maps in the opposite direction. And that's because I've taken formal linear combinations of effects mm -hmm. and not formal linear combinations of states, because you can, just, you can just decide which one you do. So I'm working in the Heisenberg picture here, so I, I've, I've flipped the order of things here. Okay. Um, so a thing that, that people in GPT sometimes assume, which is a useful thing to have, 
But you see here that these effects are a subset of all the possible effects in the audio space. And the states are a subset of all the possible states. So what they call the no restriction hypothesis is say that like all mathematically definable effects and states are physically realizable. Which is not an operational statement, mm -hmm. it's just a useful statement. It, it, it makes your life easier if you accept this. Because then you, you don't have to work this additional structure, okay, what are my actual real effects? You just say, oh, I just have one unit space and you're done. You just take all the structure on your unit space. So, um, it depends on like, why you're doing a restructuring quantum theory, whether this is reasonable to accept. If you, if you are thinking like, suppose I didn't know about quantum theory and I wanted to derive it from first principle, um, that if someone stumbled upon this definition of GPTs and of unit spaces, I think this, this would be very reasonable. Because like, if I were to like, go about it, I would look at first the easiest case, I would just take the effects to be the entire space, and take the states to be all the possible states. But if I'm thinking about, okay, I know this quantum theory, and I want to have a, as nice as possible axiomatic reconstruction of it, then I wouldn't assume this, because this is not an operational assumption. Okay, so it's kind of dependent on like, what do you care about when you assume this. Um, like at some point it needs to be derived in your in your proof anyway because quantum theory does satisfy this. Like if I take the audience space of quantum theory, then like I do get all effects and do get all states. So okay. Um, yes. Okay. So uh, as I said, as I just said, I um, um, in GPTs people like working with finite dimensional spaces. It makes your life a lot easier. Um, an operational assumption that like ensures your vector space is finite dimensional is saying that your system satisfies finite tomography. So that every state is characterized with just a finite number of different measurements. So this very long statement. And this turns out to be equivalent to saying that your all unit spaces are finite dimensional. Okay. And uh, we this dimension of all unit space is sometimes called the tomographic dimension, because it's the amount of unique measurement outcomes you need to completely characterize a state. So if you it's the term called like uh, state tomography in physics. Like, um, uh, yeah. So it is called. Uh, uh, hmm? So that's what's your proof for the definition? It seems that what you have written in words is the reverse of what you have written in the equation. So there exists a measurement, so that for every two states, they are equal in all these measurement outcomes, even only if they're the same state. Which is saying that like there, uh, there is uh, a finite number of measurement outcomes that's enough to characterize the full state. Mm. So for, uh, for instance, for the qubit system, you could take an x, <laughs> x measurement and z measurement. Okay, but for all states, the way to characterize it is the same, or the same effect. Could be the other way around, right? Um, the, the, the effects that helps to characterize it depend on the capacity. Yes, you could define this dually, I guess. Yeah, yeah but it's... Um, yeah. Okay, never mind. Yeah, I think also because of, um, yeah, 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 you're right. It's not super obvious why this would imply it, um, but it is true, I think, because there, if, um, let's see, because, yeah, if this, um, suppose this were true, but space were infinite dimensional, then you can just take um, a effect outside of the span of these effects, and then your behavior on these states would not necessarily be defined, and then you can do this, um, uh, there's this result about linear maps from a vector space that you can then extend to an entire vector space, like I don't... Mm. Uh, Han Banach, I think the Han Banach theorem then says that you can find a place where these states must be different. But yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so this is usually the reason that uh, people in GPT say, okay, all, everything is finite dimensional, because operationally, you can only ever do a finite amount of measurements. So like, you could say, well, the vector space is infinite dimensional, but you can never test it. You can never go up, to, up, up the infinite dimensions. Um, okay. Is there any other way to find out if your space is the finite dimension or not? Um, I'd say like if you have more information about what your order in space should be, then maybe you can find a property that's satisfied by the finite dimensional system, not by yeah, the infinite so dimensional system. So in principle, system. it could be a measurable thing, or not? Um, yeah, it could be a measurable thing that your space is infinite dimensional, but then you can never fully characterize your states. Which like sort of like then it's not really operational anymore because you're just doing a thing but you don't know the, yeah mm -hmm. your state becomes not operational if you can't measure it yeah okay um, so right now I've only talked about like a single system in isolation it's a single system I prepare it I do a transformation to a measurement 
of course, like we can combine subsystems into a larger system. Um, so uh, most most time GPTs, like if we have two separate systems, we can take a composite system, which is often defined using the tensor product symbol, or we just concatenate the, the letters. Um, so what should the properties of such a thing be? Um, well, um, if we have a state on this system A, we have a state on system B, well, kind of, kind of the definition of what it means to be a composite system is that these states should combine to be a state of the composite system, right? There should be a way to get a state on the composite system. Uh, not saying that all the states here are of this form, because that's not true in quantum theory reference, because you have entangled states, but this is definitely should be a state there. Um, and also, if, if you think about the logic like the coin flipping and based on that uh, deciding which state to prepare, it becomes obvious you should have this equality that like this uh, affine structure pulls through the tensor products. Okay? Uh, similarly, for effects, we want to be able to take a tensor product effect like this. So, the way we can define a composite system is that we say that for every pair of systems A and B, there should be a system C and a bilinear map between the order unit spaces that uh, maps the tensor products of one to one, and it maps a positive, uh, yeah, and if you have positive elements, it should also be positive. So sort of like a bi-positive, bi-unital map, that we have here. Um, and like, this is very, this is quite a general definition, like this does not really restrict much what your composite system can be. Um, so far so good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, as I said, this doesn't really restrict much what composite, composite system can be, which is not very useful if you want to prove stuff. Um, so an assumption that's made very often is called local tomography. And what it says is if I have two states on my composite system, so now these could be entangled states in the quantum setting, if they are equal on all local measurements, then they must have been the same state. So if you think about it operationally, I could have like a single lab and I can prepare my uh, state in this composite system and I send one half to like a very distant uh, lab and I send the other half to a further distant lab there and I just tell them, do whatever you want, but at the end you need, you need to come together and you, need, and you need to decide on what state I just sent you. So if you have local tomography, this is possible. If you don't have local tomography, it's not possible. There will be different states that will have the same outcomes for whatever measurement they do there. Mm. Okay. So, um, again, finite tomography, of, uh, yeah, if you have finite tomography, so your, your, your unit space is finite dimensional, then local tomography can be characterized as saying that the dimension of your composite system should be the product of the dimensions of your, of your, of your subsystems, which should be familiar to uh, people from quantum theory, like this is indeed true if you take your, uh, your uh, operators to be uh, operators on the, on, on the Hilbert space, a complex Hilbert space. Yeah, so quantum theory and classical theory both sets for local tomography. What's interesting is that if I replace the complex numbers in my Hilbert space by real numbers, it does not satisfy local tomography. And the way you can see this is if I take a, a rebit system, so a qubit then real, the algebra that describes this is uh, the 2 by 2 self adjoint matrices over the real numbers. This is a three-dimensional algebra. It's uh, spanned by the identity and by the x and uh, by the x and z Pauli matrices, but not the y Pauli matrix, right? So it's a three-dimensional algebra. And if I take two of those, and I take a tensor product, I should get the four by four matrices of the real numbers, the self adjoint matrix of the real numbers. And you can check that this algebra is ten-dimensional. So I get a three-dimensional algebra, three-dimensional algebra, I take the tensor product, and I get a ten-dimensional algebra. Mm -hmm. So there's one degree of freedom that's not captured by the local system. And this corresponds to uh, the Pauli matrix y, so then y tensor y. Because even though a single y contains complex numbers, so it's not on the real and the real thing, if I take two y's, the complex numbers cancel out and becomes a real matrix. Mm. So this is the degree of freedom that's not captured in the local model. So in real quantum theory, the composite system strictly contains more like information, more degrees of freedom than the sum, the sum of the parts. Which is like for a long time, for a long time I thought like, okay, sure, like that's fine. But like, if you actually start doing mathematics with it, like it becomes really annoying, and like you have, you, your intuition just gets completely lost. Um, but what's interesting is that uh, almost all the mathematics and all the results you can do for complex quantum theory, you can also do for real quantum theory. This is one of the few principles that I know of that really distinguishes them. 
So almost any reconstruction has local tomography as an assumption because it's the only way or pretty much the only way in which we can distinguish complex quantum theory from real quantum theory. Which it's one of my like hopes that I can find a different way to, to, to make a difference because it's good to have more ways to distinguish two, these two theories. Um, let's see, I think we're almost out of time, right? Okay. Um, Right, so, uh, just another example on the of a GPT. Uh, we can take our ordinary spaces, the PGT, and journal algebras. And then we just take the states and effects defined by the no restriction hypothesis. We just take all possible effects of states. And the transformations are positive unital maps in the opposite direction. Uh, this is a perfectly valid GPT, and there's, very, uh, there's a lot of nice properties that are shared by quantum theory. But it has no inherent notion of composite system. It's uh, really hard to define what the tensor product of two arbitrary journal algebras should be. Um, and especially if you acquire local tomography, um, it's not a strict theorem, but it's more a thing you can derive in many circumstances that if I have a category of, of Euclidean journal algebras, which has like, it's like symmetric model structure, so it has a tensor product, and it's local tomography, then... Um, all the systems must have, must have been complex matrix algebras because those are the only ones that have proper tensor products. Because the problem with real algebras is that the tensor product becomes too large. It has, like, you get a three dimensional, three dimensional, you get a 10 dimensional algebra. Uh, complex systems are precisely in the sweet spot where if I have an n dimensional algebra and an m dimensional algebra, it combines to give exactly the right dimension. If I have two, if I have two quaternion ionic systems, my composite system is too small. It doesn't fit, it doesn't fit in there. So like, complex numbers are in precisely the sweet spot between real and quaternion Um Yeah, and it has been argued that like this is the reason we see complex Hilbert spaces in nature instead of Euclidean drawn algebras. Because even if you imagine that like at a very small scale, uh, the system is described by a Jordan algebra, then like because we only see composite systems, mm. uh, it must be represented by a complex algebra, and that's why we see complex Hilbert spaces. So that's it's like has been argued by some people to be like a description of this. Because for Euclidean and general algebras to uh, have this tensor product, they have to be. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like uh, there, there are some ways in which you can find different, like sort of uh, sort of consistent tensor products, but they're usually not locally locally tomographic. Okay. So there is a way in which you can say the tensor product of two quaternionic systems should be a real system. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, that's, that won't be locally so mapped. You have the tensor product will be bigger than like, the original space you put in. Uh, okay, and let's see. Uh, yeah, let me just discuss this one final topic. Um, so, yeah, uh, this is a, a sort of way to derive a witness theorem in GPTs. Uh, so, I say a transformation between systems is reversible if I have an inverse on both sides, basically. Okay. Um, and I want you to show like the GPT I just showed earlier for what I called like what is description of quantum theory. Um, it has maps that are completely positive trace preserving maps. And it turns out that if you have a reversible such map, then there must be a unitary that, that just implements it. So the in this setting of GPTs, reversible maps in quantum setting correspond to unitary maps. So we get sort of Wigner the theorem in sort of this, yeah, in, in, for free. And the reason it becomes easier to prove is that Wigner's theorem only concerns itself with pure states. We are concerned with the entire uh, set of density operators and mixed states. So we also have this affine structure we need to preserve. And that makes it that we don't have to care about this, um, that, we, that we don't have to care about this, uh, um, Transition probability structure to preserve. So this sort of becomes easier to prove than witness to you. Uh, yeah, so my original plan was to also cover some modern reconstructions, but I think I've run out of time, so I'll just, re uh, just do this for the next lecture. Um, I realize this lecture now has been very um, sort of foundational, and um, yeah, the next lecture we'll look at more concrete things of like, okay, what do people actually do with these GPTs, and like what kind of principles do they put on it to get quantum theory out. So uh, yeah, thank you for listening. And, uh, Thank you.